and here we go. We have liftoff. Propulsion continues to be normal. Our ACCA chamber pressure looks good. Following up. Unfolds to go. Indeed. We rise together back to the moon and beyond. Yeah! This is methane to be igniting the flare, correct? Yikes. You bet. Uh, we don't need any more of these. Hello everybody and welcome to another Starlink launch here from Cape Canaveral from Florida. As you can see we have a Falcon 9 on the pad and the, top, the, the clock I should say in the top left is ticking down to a liftoff of this Falcon 9 hopefully in just under 59 minutes from now. My name is Adrian Bile. I'm your host for today's mission and I am joined by very competent voices. Starting with Trevor. Trevor, how are you doing? You know, it's crazy that we're already here for, it's the 18th of the month, and this is the ninth Falcon flight, if all goes well. So this cadence is just absurd, and I look forward to talking more about that with you all today. Absolutely. I'm so looking forward to see, hopefully, them breaking another cadence record here, and... Uh... I mean, it's it, it's just crazy. We we are just it, it it really we are seeing a launch of Falcon Nine every two three days now, um, just like clockwork. It's uh, honestly impressive, and uh, I'm looking forward to how long they can hold this pace or even improve it down the line. We'll we'll talk about that a bit. And also, I want to welcome Julia. Julia in the field. Julia, how are you doing? I'm doing fabulous. I had a day off from my work, my my paycheck job. I am enjoying the sunshine in Florida and uh, looking forward to another launch. There we go. And uh, with 57 minutes to go on this uh, time here, we want to, of course, make sure to answer all of your questions. So make sure to tag uh, at NASA Space Flight in chat. I should uh, add to this, we want to answer all of your questions that have some uh, relation to today's mission. We will not answer any random questions, hopefully. Uh, just we will hopefully answer questions that have any connection to Falcon 9 or Starlink. And with that, Trevor, do you mind giving us an overview? What What is launching today? Yeah, of course. Um, so as usual on these missions, we'll be launching 23 Starlink V2 mini satellites into uh, low Earth orbit. And like all of these missions from the Cape, this is going to the Group 6 uh, shell, hence the 6 in 6-52. Um, so yeah, as you can see on screen, this will be launching from Slick 40 at the Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Um, that booster uh, is pretty new in the grand scheme of things. That's B-1080 flying for its seventh time. Um, it did have a pretty quick turnaround, though, at only 28 days, which... You know, it's not rare that we see 20 turnarounds in the 20 days, but it's also not super common, so that's pretty exciting. Um, following launch, that will be attempting to land on a shortfall of Gravitas, which was tugged downrange by Signet Warhorse III. That's the really fast uh, tugboat at the Cape that SpaceX has been using a lot recently so that they're able to use those drone ships uh, often. Um, then also those two fairing halves will be recovered by Doug um, downrange. And there you can see uh, a rough flight plan for today going southeast. And that large orange-ish area, that's going to be the recovery zone with the blue dot being the approximate booster landing location and the yellow being the ground track. So if you're in southern Florida or the Bahamas, you know, you have a very good chance of seeing today's launch. Um, Going over some quick missions for today's launch, because as we've alluded to, they're just kind of nutty at this point. And this will be the 326th Falcon 9 mission 
255th Falcon 9 flight with a flight proven booster, 269th reflight of a booster, uh, 38th reflight of a booster in 2024. Uh, I believe this will be the 299th booster landing um, and 225th consecutive booster landing. So um, there's a, just so many stats at this point. It's crazy how much this rocket is launching. Absolutely, and uh, I hear that correctly that the next one, which would be 653, might be the 300th booster landing, correct? Yeah, that is... That's, that's I didn't just, realize that stat until I just read it, so I had to go double-check it on a different spreadsheet, and wow, that is a lot of booster landings. Absolutely, and I, before I throw it to Julia here, I of course want to acknowledge the fact that Max and Dee are in the field for us here today, also providing camera views here, so... Uh, for uh, forgetting you there in the introduction and also Kevin Michael Reed in the background making sure that everything is uh, nice well presented and we sound and look good and with that Julia do you mind giving us an overview about the booster of today's mission and also give us a bit of a weather forecast of how it is looking in Florida I absolutely can do that and we already talked about the fleet so let's get into the booster and its missions uh, this booster First flew on the Axiom 2 mission, which was May 21st, 2023. So um, as we said, this is a relatively new booster. Um, it launched the Euclid telescope to space. We went to two more Starlink missions and then another Axiom mission. We went to the space station again with CRS-30, and then that brings us to today, which is Starlink 652. Um, again, it is just like yesterday, a beautiful day here on the Space Coast. We have some wispy clouds, a slight breeze, which is normal for uh, being right here on the coast. The moon is uh, on the rise, probably not going to be uh, much of a chance for a moonshot, but... Um, and I think I'm going to answer a question in advance. Will we get a jellyfish? And with the launch being in under an hour, unfortunately, the sun is still too high in the sky for that. So you're you're saying a bit of <laughs> now we don't of course don't want to uh, go into the window here, but in theory, the window would span I think four more hours after this. So um, not, SpaceX has not yet started propellant loading, so in theory there could be some adjustments in the window. Um, but of course, uh, for the sake of especially our infield people, we hope that uh, you all see a launch on time, I would say. I have a question for chat. Hey chat, what should the penalty be for people who speak things like this who could potentially trigger things like the S word? or moves to the right what should the penalty be i feel like i, I feel like this is kind of directed at me so uh, <laughs> let's hope let's hope i didn't talk it into existence i i really hope it's uh it's going on time I, i'm doing it again right i know we will have great views whenever it launches let me just offer you that it sounds like we may have a friend uh, a little bit farther downrange in the field and of course max and d with their awesome camera views so no matter when it launches we will have amazing views absolutely we will have uh, dr uh, dr wd 40 in the field as well which will provide hopefully another um feed down the line here so we'll see what we get today uh in the launch broadcast and with that let's Jump into questions here because I want to ask some que questions here. Starting with this question from Hazelnut. Uh, Trevor, this is going to you. Why are there black parts in the stage around the legs on Falcon 9 boosters, which are already black on its first flight? Uh, which means, uh, like, well, why, why is part of this rocket black and some of it's white? Yeah, that's a good question. So there are two black parts on Falcon 9 Block 5 that were white on <clears throat> older versions of Falcon 9. Uh, the first is obviously the inner stage, which that's also uh, white on Falcon Heavy Block 5, interestingly. And I believe that's just SpaceX choosing not to paint it. Um, so on Falcon Heavy and the older flights, um, they decided to paint the inner stage, and now they're keeping it uh, to be the composite structure that it is, which just happens to be uh, black. 
Uh, and then I believe similar for the landing legs. They just are not painting them and they're that awesome black color. And in my opinion, it makes it one of the coolest looking vehicles uh, out there. So the aesthetic of this rocket is truly amazing. There we go. So, uh, and I believe the white coloring sometimes has some pr advantages in, in theory for uh, for a thermal conditioning, but it seems SpaceX is not really caring about that much because they don't really bother cleaning up the desert and everything. So Yeah, uh, and Alex is pointing out in the back channel that <clears throat> a lot of the TPS is also black. So if you look at like the engine section of Falcon 9, um, it's all black and even uh, super heavy. Uh, the engine section is all black, and that's for TPS. And that's also the same reason why uh, the raceway is all black. So good addition from Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Indeed, as always, uh, watching Falcon 9 with us here. Um, and uh, Julia here, a uh, question for you. For reference, what is the optimal time for Sun to get a jellyfish? Like, first off, do you mind explaining quickly what a jellyfish is and what would be the optimal time to get one? Hmm. Well, the optimal time to get one would be as the sun is setting. So um, I would say, oh, goodness. You know, a lot of it's luck, y'all. But scientifically, <laughs> um, I would say as the sun is low on the horizon, just went under the horizon um, from our point of view. Um that's probably your best shot at it because there's enough ambient light. And as the rocket gets higher in the sky, that's where the fun begins. Um, a jellyfish is that interaction of light uh, as the rocket ascends and the different plumes interact, such as um, the small thrusters from fairings or second stage continuing on. And if you go back to the um, Inspiration4 mission footage, you will see a magnificent example of a jellyfish. And this can happen in the morning, but a little more rare um, during sunrise. But um, And sometimes, guess what? If you got a full moon, the moon will add some moon glow and make a unique jellyfish. A moon, moon jellyfish, kind of. Moonfish. So... <laughs> Moonfish, I like that. Um, but yeah, it's 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 one of these visual effects that we get from time to time, which are amazing. Um, it's just a a matter of, of course, SpaceX is not trying to uh, put launches where they look fancy. They try to put the launches where they are needed, based on the orbital trajectory needed. So it's uh, it's just a matter of us getting lucky that these two interests align. So we'll see if we get some of these phenomenons in the future. Um, Trevor, Train 9 here asking, when do you think we will ever see a seven Falcon flights in one single week? Ooh. Um, honestly, I don't think we're that far off from SpaceX being able to do that. Right? We've shown, they've shown that they're able to do these triple headers, you know, not reliably at this point, because generally weather will delay one or you know they'll have some small technical issue but that with you know pads being able to be turned around in four to five days that's already six launches and slick 40 is even quicker than that so you know even right now with the cadence they have they're at the point where seven launches is not completely unreasonable so i wouldn't be surprised if we see this I think this year is probably a little bit early, but I could see it toward the end of this year, but probably into ne uh, uh, next year. But it's worth noting that this at, when they first start doing seven Falcon flights in a week, it would probably be like they got lucky and got seven in one week, and then the next week is emptier while they're turning around pads and drone ships and whatnot. But we're getting very close to this being a reality. Yeah, I think we need to... Oh, go ahead, Julia. Oh, I was just going to say that would have to be one amazing weather week. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I yep. and 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 to to reliably do this, you'd probably have to start the week out with a Vandenberg, you know, launch early in the week, day 1 or day 2, um to offer some a little bit of pad turnaround time at like 39 and 40. Um as far as drone ships go, you're you're going to need a combination of uh RTLS in there as well. So 
either you take off a few starlings and you launch some of your own, um, or you have some customer missions that you happen to time out or their orbital uh, insertions are in line with that week that you want to attempt this. Um, I'm not saying it can't be done. It's a logistical puzzle, though. Absolutely. Um, it's... Uh... It's. I think we would have to have like this perfect storm where they basically target. I don't know. Um, if we call Sunday the beginning of the week, although I always feel like it's Monday, um, it would be like basically on the first day of the week, and then you just have this perfect storm of them uh, turning all the pets around in basically record time. But I, the crazy thing is, we are not talking about it being impossible. We are talking about it in theory being possible, which already feels insane right we are we are talking about hey is spacex able to launch a rocket seven times a week and the answer is not oh obviously no the answer is hmm, maybe and not to mention right i know this question says seven falcon flights but if you let one of those launches be starship all of a sudden this is not that difficult for spacex to achieve from a logistics perspective um but i don't know i hope we see this at some point soon <laughs> i was gonna say yep. because if you add starship in there you you've automatically got four launches you've got 30 40 39 uh four and and boca chica so right there that's four right off the bat and you can turn around oh you, you got y'all that would actually be easy if they had the perfect storm situation they could pull it off Yep, absolutely. Let's uh, let's hope we see that at some point. I I want to see them like tr pushing the cadence even harder, and we'll see what we get. I I I want to see more falcons. They they don't get boring. <laughs> no, they don't. Let me uh, thank some supporters here before we get into fueling here, and after this we will dive into the timeline. You know what's coming up. Uh, DA Swanson becoming a red team member. Thank you so much for that. Uh, JJ, JJ Cologne uh, becoming a Red Team member. Thank you for that as well. Uh, Coco Cats gifting a Red Team membership is also a very a common name we hear here. Thank you so much. <laughs> Stefan Batiste asking, what is the green wall for? Oxygen. The green, <laughs> wall is for, the green wall is in fact for oxygen. That's um, what keeps us humans alive. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of important. It's, it's supplying not even liquid, it's actually providing gaseous oxygen for the human operations. Um, Carlo here uh, with a storm message saying, thank you, NSF, come visit uh, Mahia Pansala, New Zealand. I actually, honestly, New Zealand is very high on my, uh, I really want to um, visit that place list. So yeah, maybe I will visit my New Zealand somewhere. not even hot take is that Mahia Peninsula may be the most gorgeous launch pad in the world. Rocket Lab site down there is so pretty. Yes. I think that Kodiak and Andoya are yeah. probably the, the easy top threes. Like they are they are just cinematic. And I, I, I hope uh, our Florida people forgive me for saying that. Julia, I'm I'm sorry. Ju the Flo the Cape would be placed for. You know, you're not hurting my feelings because I actually have the same sentiment about that launch pad. It is gorgeous. And there's something even about um, Kodiak, Alaska. I don't know why, it, it, if it's the desolation out there, but there's something gorgeous about that area as well that, yes, we, I love our Space Coast. It's just a little bit more operational uh, than beautiful. We'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think with industrialization and like being operational, there comes just a certain amount of losing a bit of of, of your natural uh, beauty of the spaceport. That's just, I think, very normal. But you know what? We are more accessible than <clears throat> the other coast, so there's that. A absolutely, I, I'm. I uh, J Jack is not here, so I can say it with confidence. I like. I I, I will. I would probably watch a launch from Florida over. Uh, over Vandenberg. I feel like it's it's getting a bit more accessible and closer. <clears throat> uh, and here we have a, uh, a ex post from Brevard act, uh, confirming that they have activated their launch operation support uh, in preparations for the today's launch. 
And we also got a uh, X post from SpaceX a bit earlier that they are still targeting the opening of the window of T minus one hour at that point. Uh, so at this point, uh, we should be in the area where SpaceX is getting ready to start propellant loading. I don't know if we have the timeline ready to show it in case we want to do that. But um, there we go. And we are arriving just in 90 seconds from now at the step where the launch director will verify the go for launch for today's mission. And uh, after that, just four, uh, three minutes later, they will start to load uh, oxygen and RP-1. Trevor, how long does it take until we will get really good confirmation that today's mission is indeed go? Yeah, so from propellant load to seeing visible signs of frost on the vehicle, it's usually like seven minutes or so. Like it changes a good amount depending on atmospheric conditions and whatnot. Um, so hopefully, you know, by approximately T minus 25 to 28 minutes, we'll have a good idea. There we go. Uh, Julia, from your position, will you be able to uh, catch the uh, one once we will see condensation regarding propellant loading? I'm 12 miles away. Um, so probably not. Probably not. <laughs> No, no, I, I am I am at a, a public viewing spot um, right off US-1, one of the very um, popular ones, Rotary Riverfront Park, which as people are getting off work and uh, finishing dinner, locals are starting to show up. Um, but we are roughly 12 miles away from the pad. So my friends out at Cape here, out at KSC, they definitely got a better view than me. There we go, but uh, you will still see it lift off very easily there, so... Oh, absolutely. You're, you have that over Trevor and me, who will just see it here on the screens, which are also amazing views, by the way. Thanks to Kevin and Michael uh, Reed. <laughs> I can get a view of the rocket launching from my backyard if I really wanted to. Okay. When I, I'm lazy yeah. and it's really late at night, yes, I do step out my back door. I look up um, about... Mm, 20 seconds after the rocket lifts off, it's over the tree lines and I can see it go down range. So advantages that's, of living where I do. Yeah, that's a flex. I, uh, so far, I had no luck wa watching any rocket launch launches where I live. So I feel like it's not coming in the near time future. Maybe we, can, maybe we can give you a Starlink train. How about that? Yeah, I saw several Starlink trains. I think this is... Okay, hot take. Uh, I think it's, uh, while I, of course, uh, understand the concerns of especially astronomers with the Starlink trains and, like, the visibility, there is something cool about seeing them. I I totally agree that astronomers and, and their uh, concerns are way more valid than me liking, uh, liking some light dots. Um, but it's still cool sometimes to see something that was human-made and launched on, your, on the sky flying by. I also think it's very cool when you see the ISS, for example. That's, uh, it's just a very cool feeling of knowing like, oh, that's, that's a human-made thing that is just flying by. And what's cool about the ISS is that that is something that we can share globally with each other, spotting the space station and, and talking to them via radio. That's something any of us, any of our viewers can do, which is pretty darn cool. To certainly check out like there are def all different apps for that where you can check the current position of the ISS and if it's visible today. So if you ever have a clear night, check out these kind of apps and check maybe if you can see the ISS. Uh, we should be one minute away from the beginning of propellant loading here. So we will start to uh, put our eyes very close to the bottom of this rocket and also look, of course, at X if we will see any confirmation by SpaceX uh, of today's mission. Um, Trevor... If what pet percentage is that we will today get a shortened second stage nozzle today? And can you explain quickly what the second stage nozzle even is? Yeah, so thankfully, zero uh, percent. Uh, what the second stage nozzle is for is for missions that where they don't need all of Falcon 9's performance. So say it's a small payload on top going to a low orbit, um, a low Earth orbit. You don't need a big inclination change or anything like that. You don't need all the performance that Falcon has, even when you're already doing an RTLS uh, with that first stage booster. So what SpaceX has decided to do is just put these really short nozzles on the second stage on these missions, uh, which looks absolutely horrible, but helps save them on, uh, you know, the cost of the nozzle and just use less material in general. 
So while this nozzle is less efficient, um, by we think it's on the order of five to ten percent less efficient, um, and produces slightly less thrust. Despite that, they don't need that performance, so it's perfectly fine. Uh, but on these Starlink missions, they need every drop of performance that is in that vehicle. So they want that full-size nozzle, right? These Starlink missions are on the order of 16 tons that they're placing into low Earth orbit. And to be fair, it is a fairly low orbit of, well, I believe about 280 by 290 kilometers generally. Um, but that is a lot of mass for Falcon 9, especially when you're recovering that booster. So that's why uh, on these Starlink missions, they will never use the short nozzle. There we go. And uh, the, that's like they're really trying to get everything out of performance here, out of these these kind of missions. Uh, it's it's basically the the upper end of what they can get out of Falcon 9. And yeah. we also have a notification here from SpaceX, which is, of course, the company that will launch this today, uh, saying propellants are flowing into Falcon 9 at Pad 40 ahead of this evening's launch. So it looks like we are currently go, and that means also we are locked in, right, Trevor? Yes, so at this point, now that they have started propellant load, they really don't have that much wiggle room uh, in the T0. If they wanted to m switch to a different T0 today, they would basically have to decide to scrub right now and enter that recycle process. Uh, but as soon as propellants are starting to be put onto the Falcon 9 stages, they're locked into that uh, instantaneous T0. And that's because unlike most rockets, like all of the Russian, or most of the Russian rockets, uh, all of the Chinese rockets, all of ULA's rockets, and even previous Falcon uh, vehicles, SpaceX super chills uh, the propellant. So they cool down uh, the RP-1 and the liquid oxygen to below their boiling temperature uh, by a decent amount. So that means that um, they want that propellant to be as cold as possible for launch and uh, also means that they don't have quite the wiggle room with the T0 that we see in some other vehicles. There we go. So uh, let's, uh, at this point, we certainly know that there will be condensation at the bottom of Falcon 90 very soon. So uh, have your eyes at that bottom of the rocket. Um, you will... The, usually the first thing you will see is some like puffs, almost like little clouds coming from the bottom. So uh, let's let's try to spot that as soon as it happens, as we yeah, now know will... that Falcon 9 is in countdown. Go ahead, Trevor. Yeah, and you'll start to see that frost line appear approximately a quarter of the way up the vehicle at the start of the liquid oxygen tank. Um, Keep in mind, Falcon has its tank swapped from Starship, where Starship has locks on the bottom and CH4 on top. Uh, Falcon has RP-1 on the bottom and liquid oxygen on top. Is that a frost ring, by the way? I don't think we can quite see it yet, but that may be the start of it. It's hard to tell. I think it's like uh, I think it's forming in front of my eyes right now. Yeah, that's the you can see it on the left of the frost ring. You can see that the that there's condensation uh, yeah. next to it. Yep, there it is. That's the visual confirmation we were looking for. There we go. Uh, so, Falcon 9 is indeed being fueled at this point, and we are looking at a liftoff in, well, half an hour from now. So, uh, stay tuned for that, and let's hope they have a smooth countdown. Julia, we have an interesting question here uh, I want to ask you uh, that is about flying rockets overhead. Uh, when do you think flying over land will be an option, like flying planes over land, uh, for example, for Starlings. Like, you're, you're, of course, like very close to these. Would you feel safe if a Falcon 9 launches over your, your house right now? Mm, no. Well, a Falcon 9 at this point, probably just because of how many of them I have seen. Uh, but we do dog-like maneuvers for a reason. Um, like I said, I can walk out of my house and see a rocket launch, right? Which gives, I'm about 13 miles away from those pads. If it were to launch west and go over my house, it would still be low enough relatively that should there be an incident, it would do damage. Um, the explosion and the amount of fuel alone would 
cause a shockwave that could probably shatter all of my windows at home. So although I feel like I could say Falcon 9 is reliable, do I feel like we should have airplane-like operations going over land this close to a launch pad? No. No, if it launched farther offshore and was at a higher altitude by time it got over somewhere like Titusville, maybe. But from where they're currently launching, that would probably still not be a great idea. There we go. Trevor, any additional input on this? Um, I mean, we they kind of already do. Um, right on some of the missions, like in the Southern Polar, Polar Launch Corridor, I believe there's a little bit of land that the vehicles fly over and then you know while the further down range they're very we very often fly over parts of europe and parts of africa and whatnot and while you know the argument is there's a much smaller amount of time where there would have to be an issue with the vehicle that debris would land in that area it still is flying over land so i think sooner than later it'll be something that is more acceptable. Yep, I uh, I think it's it's really a matter of like making really sure you're yeah, like like especially the regulatory body, bodies who decide this, for example, the FAA, um, that they feel confident that they are that that this is a safe operation. So, um, as long as they are not there yet, I I'm fine with that. And if they decide it's there yet, well then, I I hope they they did their homework. <laughs> So let's see here. Uh, Trevor, Elisar asking, by the way, shout outs to Elisar, one of our uh, people working on social media here. Um, a few launches ago, SpaceX launched 24 instead of uh, 23. Any reasons they uh, went yes. back to 23? Yeah, this is, uh, I think, a question that a lot of us are wondering. Uh, this isn't completely unexpected. When they've gone from 22 to 23 in the past, right? they first flew 23 and then they've had a few more stacks of 22 lying around and then they eventually went to all missions being 23 from uh, the east coast so we don't have a super good idea of w what why they're deciding not to continue with launching 24 um perhaps there is a little bit of data that they don't super like uh, that they want to you know make some tweaks to the satellites perhaps those satellites were a newer uh like a slightly newer version and they don't have any more of those satellites ready to launch yet since maybe they were like partially beta satellites or something like that. Um, we have no idea, uh, but we definitely know that SpaceX will go back to that 24 number in the future. And uh, more than that, we have heard that they expect to, by the end of the year, get up to 28 satellites on some of these Starlink missions. So... That's a lot of satellites. I'm kind of hesitant of the 28 number, but it still shows that SpaceX wants to continually add more and more satellites onto these launches. Absolutely. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting to observe because it seems like they can do it, like the 24 mission went fine, right? So it's, uh, it's really an interesting thing to, to see if this at some point, maybe something didn't, they, maybe they didn't like something going on. on we don't know. So, yeah, it's, it's it is worth noting though that on these Starlink missions, right, you get pre-launch uh, TLEs, which say what orbit the satellite's going to go into, and then we also get post-launch TLEs. Where did the satellite actually end up? And on that mission with 24 satellites, it was the exact orbit that they were targeting. They got into the stage successfully, deorbited, and they successfully recovered the fairings in first stage. So everything. Uh, objectively went perfectly fine on that mission. Um, so it's, it may just be something, you know, some small piece of data that SpaceX wasn't a huge fan of, but the mission was completely successful. There we go. It's, uh, it's, I mean, that's always the middle ground here, because there can, there can be things where, where SpaceX doesn't like something in the data, and the mission still goes well. But since they are, like, observing, of course, especially with these Pathfinder missions... Um, they might be always something where they're like, let's maybe go back to the drawing board for a bit and uh, reconsider. Um, Trevor, I know you have a spreadsheet for this, so I will just ask this. Uh, have there been any expended, expended Falcon 9s this year yet? Uh, this year, no. 
Um, the last expended launch was, I believe it was on USS F-52 uh, last year in December. Um, and since that somewhat doesn't count, since that's Falcon Heavy Center Core, if I remember correctly, the last Falcon 9 that was expended, I mean, besides from Viasat, um, may have been all the way back at UTELSAT uh, in 2022, but it's certainly been a while since we've seen SpaceX expend a Falcon 9. Which is coming up with uh, the, I think, the Galileo mission, right? Yeah. Uh, the Galileo FOC FM25 FM27 mission will most likely expend a booster. So. Yeah, and we're expecting that to be B-1060 on its 20th flight, which will be expended. Yeah, I mean, it's always sad to see one of these like high flight boosters go, but of course it makes sense to do it with a high flight booster. If you have to do it, do it with something that that has already more is more past its lifetime, right? So. Yeah, Elon's yeah. briefly talked about this that going forward they want all of the expended launches to be on the oldest booster in the fleet, since they definitely have, even though it's still Falcon Nine Block Five. Um, made many uh, changes to these newer boosters which make them quicker to turn around, easier to fly more. And that's somewhat visible in the turnaround times. I don't think these turnaround times are completely a, a great statistic to look at in terms of ease of, uh, of turning around. But the early Block 5 boosters were in the like 100-day turnaround. And now some of them, like B-1081, is 44.96 days average, um, and that's across several flights. So again, not a very good indicator of turnaround, of the easiness that it is to turn around a booster, but we're definitely seeing that average come down across the entire fleet. Yep, absolutely. I guess this is also coming down with stuff like skipping certain inspections that you noticed you don't need them, or skipping, skipping certain steps in the refurbishment process where they notice that they can make them faster, automate them, or don't perform them anymore at all since they uh, notice they might have been obsolete. So, well, we'll see how this changes over time. Um, let me see here. Musical Wolves with a super chat saying, will SpaceX eventually get a newer drone ship capable of multiple booster landings on it without having to return back to the Cape? Uh, Julia, how do you think is the future of drone ships? Uh, do you ever have a new one? What's what's your what's your take on this? I don't think we need another one. Um, I, I they're showing that they can uh, turn around, secure a booster, and turn around and come back to Cape pretty fast. And they need minimal time at uh, at port to turn around. So, if you throw in some more RTLS, I don't think we really need one. Um, not another one, but I, have I heard of another one being um, manufactured or readied? No, I have not. What I'm eager to see is what in the world Blue is going to do, but that's still a mystery as well. There was you know what that else is a mystery? Oh, God. What might be in the air that we might get to see during this launch? Because I'm hearing down in Cocoa Beach, there's low flying planes and we have an air show in the area. Sorry, I just had to put that in there. <laughs> that's cool um, for the whole drone ship though thing though there was that interesting post on x the other day from kiko where gavin had one of uh nsf's fleet trackers um had made a post saying like oh there's a few more of the marmac style barges uh that have been constructed the same style that all three of spacex drone ships are for are uh, oh, there are those planes just over the launch pad. That was cool. Um, yep. And uh, he was like, I wonder if any of the space companies are buying these to have as drone ships. And Kiko responded with like a thinking emoji or something like that. So it certainly seems to hint that maybe in the future there will be another drone ship. And whether that's soon uh, or longer term is unknown. But I could definitely see them as soon as... Uh, Slick 6 is operational going into that, but uh, speaking of operational, we have that T-20 minute and 20 second vent going. I'm so proud of that transitions. Yes, uh, Al Trevor, what's what's happening here with the T-20 minute vent? 
Yeah, so this is Locke's chill down of the strong back. So the second stage of Falcon 9 is fueled in two stages. The first is they load RP-1 onto the vehicle and that starts at T-35 minutes like we said before. Then uh, to load the liquid oxygen as late as possible so that it's as cool as possible for launch, they don't start loading the liquid oxygen onto that stage until T-16 minutes. So to get the lines in the transporter reactor ready for filling of the second stage with liquid oxygen, um, they want to chill them down. So they're currently running liquid oxygen through those lines, and that's um, since they're still warm, uh, it's you know causing that condensation, that big cloud of uh, uh, venting that we see on camera right now. There we go, and this vent will stop in roughly three minutes from our right, and then they start the next step of loading. So let's see how this goes, but this is a good sign. This is like, don't panic. This this vent is very good. They are they are on track for today's mission, and so far, from what we can tell, uh, everything is going well with today's countdown. Mm -hmm. Let me hit some more support here, starting with uh, Ned Saunders gifting a red team membership. Thank you so so much, uh, Adrian. Not me. Also gifting a red team membership. I, I don't know why I clarified that. Of course, it's not me, but I just want to point it out. Uh, John Dupker with a $5 super chat. I wonder if SpaceX can give me some tips on nozzle design, because mine apparently are terrible. Um, I wish you good luck with future nozzle, nozzle design, but uh, that sounds like there were maybe some, some problems with ignition. Um, during some some model flights, uh, that that sounds for me like it, and I wish you best of luck in future nozzle design. Um, and then, oh no, <sighs> we have Kevin Michael Reed with a two dollar super chat <laughs> asking tortured poets department question mark. This is for Trevor, and we also have LSR with a five dollar super chat saying if Falcon Nine was a song from TTPD. Which would it be? Um, I have two answers for this. The first is Florida with three exclamation points because, of course, this is launching from Florida. And then the other, for me, would be love of my life because Falcon is the love of my life for better or worse. There we go. Um, I'm glad people uh, put in Taylor Swift questions into the <laughs> Super Chat Q year. Thank you so much for that. Thanks. And, uh, I take really them. appreciate all of them. I'm so excited for this album. I was just—I was just gonna say, can can y'all feel the smile through his voice? Because I can, and, <laughs> and thanks y'all yep. for making that happen. So, uh, will you listen to it at midnight or something when it releases, or what's their plan? Oh yeah, I'm As, this. we'll be refreshing Apple Music and YouTube, uh, at, starting at like. 9.30 my time, 11.30 Eastern, to make sure as soon as it drops, I can start listening. There we go. I wish you I wish you a lot of fun. And then we also uh, see the feed from Dr. WD40 here, I think, which is uh, well, which will also provide some tracking here. So um, we'll get some, some nice tracking here today. It feels like we're getting a lot of, lot of different camera angles. And I'm looking forward to see today's... Uh, Falcon 9 fly in just uh, about 15 minutes, 60 minutes from now. As it's getting more and more frosty. Which is good. Uh, Trevor, in any given moment... How, sorry, I'm quickly hitting time on here as we are now beginning stage 2 locks load. And uh, after that engine chill, where they prepare the 9 Merlin uh, engine in preparation before ignition. And kind of pre-chill them and making sure they're not getting completely... Completely cryo-shocked. And then we are moving into the liftoff potion. So let's hope everything goes as it goes right now. And we see all these steps uh, being checked in succession. Trevor, in any given moment, how many Falcon 9s are active and how many of those are being refurbished? Ooh, that's, that's a hard question because what exactly... How exactly do you define a Fal an active Falcon 9 core? So, for example, like we were just talking about earlier, uh, we're expecting B-1060 to get expended on an upcoming mission. So do you count that as an active booster, even though it already has a mission assigned where it'll be expended? Oh, there are those jets again. 
I am not a plane that's person, right. so I, I know that's a plane. I don't know what plane. <laughs> um, and then additionally, right, you have some uh, boosters that are being tested at McGregor that may have completed a static fire that have missions uh, that are assigned. Do you count that as an operational booster? Um, but to try to answer your question the best I can, I believe SpaceX has, let me count, 7, 8, uh, 11, 15, okay, about 19 boosters right now in their fleet that have launched um, but have uh, not been expended or lost yet. So how many of those are in refurbishment at a given time? We really have no idea as the public. Um, Right, we don't know if the a lot of the boosters in Hangar Hangar X are just sitting there being ready uh, ready for launch or are undergoing refurbishment or whatnot. Uh, we just unfortunately do not have good insight into that. Yep, there we go. Uh, a question here from Twenty Minute Vent. Good timing with that. Uh, can SpaceX make stubby airbag engines? Will it affect performance? To my not knowledge, and correct me if I'm wrong, here, Trevor, Trevor, the airbags are already based on what be, would be optimal for their performance. Already kind of stubby, right? So yeah, um, that's my understanding is that they're not quite as long uh, as they may be longer term. And one thing that one reason for this is unlike the Merlin vacuum engine, SpaceX isn't able to just take the nozzle off of the RVAC and test it. So what SpaceX does at McGregor uh, when they're testing these Merlin vacuum engines is they take the bell off um, and then just fire the engine assembly. Uh, and that way they don't have to worry with any, about any flow separation or whatnot. Um, but the RVAC has pretty um, crucial in, uh, parts of it um, that are uh, in the nozzle that are needed for that test. So they can't take it off and instead what they do is they put a ring stiffener on it. And what that ring stiffener does is just helps make sure that any oscillations in the engine caused by that flow separation uh, doesn't cause huge vibrations in the engine that uh, completely destroy it. So um, I find it unlikely that SpaceX will want to make the RVAC any shorter, especially given that um, at some point, if you want to put more engines on the second stage, you would just, and you want them to have shorter nozzles, why wouldn't you just put another sea level RVAC on it? Or a sea level Raptor, not sea level RVAC. <laughs> yep, absolutely. It's, uh, uh, basically, it's a compromise that they can do because of space, uh, Star uh, sorry, Falcon 9's performance on Falcon 9, because they don't need the performance here. Uh, but if you're still performance restrained, you wouldn't do that because, well, it's, it's a small model. It loses your performance. It's less optimized. So don't, like, they wouldn't do that if they would need the performance. Um, let's look at the visibility map from this. And, uh, Julia, you also, I'm bringing in for this, like, of course, we have these visibility maps of where the rocket is uh, visible and will be visible during ascent, but I guess it also depends a lot on local conditions at that liftoff time? It does depend on the conditions, just like how much you hear the rocket is going to depend on the conditions. The last launch I was out for, I, I was sad because um, I didn't get a great big rumble, which sucks, but um, <clears throat> the wind was going the wrong way. The wind was going toward the Atlantic. Today I'm looking at the trees and <clears throat> the wind's blowing right at me. So if nothing else, I will get good sound today. Uh, we're still looking at those low, wispy clouds out here, so looks like all the way downrange along the Space Coast, you'll have a great view. There we go, and just checking in with you, because I know at some point during the next 10 minutes, we will also have to uh, probably say goodbye for you to enjoy the launch, but uh, first question here is, like, uh, weather conditions, anything that would you mark right now as, oh, that might be a watch item, or does everything just look great? Everything looks just great to me. Um, I mean, a breeze is nothing for a Falcon 9, and there are no thick clouds out here, and thick clouds are the ones that maybe could create lightning, so we're good. There we go. So everything 10 minutes before liftoff here looking good for Falcon 9. So let's hope uh, this trend continues. As you can see it there on the right cam, like that's, that's gorgeous conditions 
Like, nothing there screams to me, oh, that might be an issue for a rocket launch. So, let's, uh, let's hope this goes on. Um, let's see here. What do we have? Uh, how, this, this is an interesting question. I know it's probably going to be hard to fully answer, but I will still let you a bit uh, uh, ramble about it, Trevor. Uh, how often are Merlin engines swap, swapped out of a booster? Oh, this another is an F-22. Uh, is it an F-22? Do we have confirmation of that? I, I was yelled at at the back channel that it's an F-22, so I hope it is that. I'm also not a plane uh, person, so I'm totally... Like, uh, Trevor and I are the worst two people to have. Okay, Max says it's an F-22, so it's an F-22, y'all. And I'm not even going to lie about how jealous I am of their launch view right now, so... Yeah, yeah that would be cool. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so this is another really good question that I would so love to have a better idea of, but unfortunately, we don't have that much insight into this process. What we do know is, I guess it's on the order of two months ago at this point, SpaceX had a post on X following a launch saying that an engine on that flight had flown for the 22nd time. And um, keep in mind, at that time, I believe the most times a booster had flown was 19. So we know that there is, um, that they change out engines a decent amount. Uh, for them to be able to get that, which 22 en uh, flights of a single engine is bonkies, uh, as Jack would say. So beyond that, we don't have a great idea. We know that the same three engines are used for every uh, landing sequence, uh, engine one, engine five, and engine nine. Uh, so I would conjecture that those are swapped out a little bit more often, uh, just because there's more wear on them. Um, but we don't, we unfortunately don't have a, a good idea on you know, if this is a regular part of refurbishment or if it's pretty rare that they have to swap out engines. Um, if anyone from SpaceX is um, listening to this and has permission to let us know, it'd be awesome if Kiko or someone like that would post a little bit more about this process, but I find it unlikely that we'll ever get that detail. There we go. Uh, it would be like, there's also another question of they, if they track them. I mean, of course, SpaceX would track them. They are like probably some sort of inventory numbers, and they 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 have probably numbered all of these engines and track. Oh, this is engine, I don't know, five hundred twelve, which is flying these that and that missions. I I bet they do that, and we yeah. hear the planes again. Are they just flying in circles? Like, Julia, are they just... Are they just flying around there? Do they have, like, any destination? Oh, um, so, you know, there is a air show relatively close to here this weekend, and <clears throat> the benefits of being military are you get to joyride over places like this during launch operations because uh, you're in constant contact with the control tower, and, uh, yeah, they're, they're joyriding out there because they will have the most insane view, and we can only hope that maybe perhaps somebody on one of those F-22s has a camera with them. That would be amazing. I like uh, unique shots that we have never seen before, and that we can see one of these planes going away in the distance. And with that, we are entering the crunch time here of today's countdown with the next step will be that the strong bag that right now supports Falcon 9 uh, will start to retract a bit in preparation to more retract um, to uh, protect itself from the fires during liftoff because uh, can get kind of hot next to a Falcon 9, I heard. <laughs> yeah. I'm always mixing this. This is the strong back that completely kicks back, right? I'm always mixing this around with this. Correct. Like I know that this is the one that actually retracts the one Vandy does not, right? Yeah. So um, this pad actually used to have uh, before Amo Six a similar design to Vandenberg, where it doesn't throw back. Uh, so the new design, like is at this pad in 39A, retracts by about 1.8 degrees at uh, T minus four and a half minutes. And then at launch, it throws back to beyond 45 degrees uh, to just get as far away from the vehicle as it can. Um, the one at Vandenberg instead 
it's a bit simpler and it just retracts by, I don't remember the exact degree amount, but I think it's like seven to 10 degrees somewhere in there uh, at T minus four ish minutes and just stays there. Um, uh, which of course means that they have to do a little bit more refurbishment on it. Um, however, right, we've seen that they've been able to get slick 40, slick four East turnaround time to be pretty low. Uh, just the other day we had a four day, uh, turnaround out of there four day, 12 hours, uh, four days, 12 hours. Exactly. Uh, and that's f similar to what slick 40s quickest turnaround was if you go like six to, uh, 10 months back. So I'm surprised by how uh, low they've been able to get it despite that older design. That said, I really hope they replace it. I do not like the old design. And with that, I want to say uh, quickly that we will uh, let Julia step aside now, because I bet you want to enjoy the launch now coming up in four minutes from now. Absolutely. And I'll be happy to share my experience after, but not going to lie, it's nice to take off the headphones and enjoy what's going on around me. Absolutely. So please do that. And we are looking forward to hear from you after launch how it was that we are now just uh, about 200 seconds, a bit more away from Falcon 9, hopefully launching. And we are in a crunch time here. The, uh, the There we can see the strong back actually retracting. You can see it now kicking a bit back there. So just what Trevor talked about happening here in real life. It's beautiful. I love the view now with uh, Slick 40 with the new crew access tower it's uh it's a really cool view and i'm looking forward to see this more in action Tara, how do you feel about this it's been throwing me off to be honest like i'm so used to when looking at photos just being like oh crew access arm it's 40 uh no crew access tower uh crew access arm 39a no crew access arm 40 so i like i've mistakenly said that slick 40 is 39a like two or three times now when i'm um, looking at photos and but it, it's awesome. It's cool that SpaceX has two pads now that are capable of launching humans. There we go. I, I really think it's a boat. <laughs> they will also get a good view. I, I always wonder if they're like all aware that there's a rocket about to launch or if they all just get scared because suddenly there's a loud rumble and a giant fireball going to the sky. <laughs> Which I think is even funnier than dead knowing. I uh, that's that's just me maybe. Uh, stage one log load is complete at this point, and we are just uh, 120 seconds or so away from Falcon 9 launching the Starlink 6-52 missions here from Slick 40. And so far, it's looking like everything is good to go. We are looking at a town countdown here. Engines are being chilled already. The strong rack is retracted. The next thing that will happen is indeed the Falcon 9 being in startup. This is where the Falcon 9 launch computer will take over the countdown. What exactly does that mean, by the way, Trevor? What's, what, what's the Falcon 9 launch computer taking over the countdown mean? Yeah, so all of the countdown will be transitioned to the internal computers on Falcon. So at this point, a lot of it's being done with uh, computers at Mission Control that are dictating the countdown. Um, but they want to transition that all to Falcon, since obviously Falcon knows what it's doing best during launch. Um, so this also comes with some other interesting tidbits. So a lot of the aborts, uh, once the vehicle is in startup, are done by vehicle as opposed to ground operators. And in fact, after T minus 10 seconds, human operators are not or cannot abort the vehicle. All aborts are fully automatic. Um, so it's just kind of a name for that SpaceX came up with signifying this transition, uh, but also at T minus one minutes, the tanks begin pressurization to their flight pressures. So they increase in pressure a little bit to make sure that they're as sturdy as they need to be uh, for the load of those nine Merlin engines that will begin igniting at T minus three seconds. Uh, so at that time, make sure you pay attention to the base of the vehicle. You may We may be able to see a green flash of that T-tab, uh, and then we'll start seeing liquid oxygen and RP-1 being flown through those engines, uh, which will eventually ignite uh, the, the vehicle, make sure all of those engines and the entire vehicle is healthy before commanding those launch clamps to release the vehicle. There we go. And SpaceX has confirmed for today's mission that they are indeed go for launch, which means we will see a rocket launching just in about 
10 seconds from now. Again, as Trevor said, watch for the bottom. That's where you will see the first signs of this launch actually happening. Uh, we are now very short it, and there is engine ignition. There you can see it. And we have a liftoff of Falcon 9 carrying the Starlink 6-52 mission with 23 more internet satellite. Let's listen into some rumble. I didn't want to interrupt until now because this was one of the best audios I think we have ever had. You yeah, that was the, awesome. You could hear everything, right? Yeah, wow. <laughs> I was saying in the back channel just how crazy that sounded. That was so cool. And um, now that it's lifted off and I can't curse it, I'll note that that was the 11th quickest turnaround of a booster, uh, which, I mean, isn't impressive, but still one of the quicker ones given there have been over 200 now. Absolutely, and uh, I'm glad you didn't jinx it uh, earlier. Also, I love that we could hear Max shouting, wow, oh, yeah. oh wow. <laughs> like, <and> I, <laughs> is, by the way, is Falcon 9 like, almost drifting at that point? Because it almost looked like it's drifting. <laughs> Look at that. Act. It kind of does in this, uh, uh, with this view, but uh, that's just the view uh, that we have since the rocket's kind of going like sideways uh, and continuing to sl slowly, I guess it's pretty, pretty much done with this pitch over, but... Um, any second now, the vehicle will begin its stage separation process. So now you can see on screen right now, that's the center pusher. Uh, so that there are three pushers radially along the booster, and then that center one that will uh, push those two stages apart like that. And then now we'll have that ignition of the MVAC engine. As you can see on the right, there is not that ring stiffener, um, which is now the new norm on these Falcon launches. Uh, and now you can also see on the left there, some pulses coming out of the first stage as it starts deploying its grid fins and preparing itself for the entry burn here uh, in several minutes. Uh, so far, I, everything looks great. And I also want to point out everything looks great on the SpaceX side, but also uh, there's the fairings. And there are the, the fairings. fairings. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. They're really visible today. Yeah, well, you can even kind of see a few RCS pulses coming out of them. Uh, keep in mind, those two fairings have uh, parachutes on them and some uh, RCS thrusters to orient themselves for re-entry. But that re-entry process takes a long time since um, those things have a lot of surface area and very little mass. So they don't splash down into the ocean until approximately T plus 45 minutes or so. And as mentioned earlier, Doug will be recovering those from the water today. Yep, it's uh, they take some time, but it's uh, it's really a testament of SpaceX commitment to to recovery that this is really still ongoing, and they're trying to really push the numbers here and how often they can reuse these fairings and uh, fish them out of the water. And with that, we are now into the coasting of the booster as it gets ready to perform its entry burn in about two minutes, I think, from now. Um, which uh, will then uh, basically start the whole recovery process, which hopefully ends with a touchdown on a shortfall of Gravitas. So let's see how this mission goes on, but so far everything good. And I believe that's, is that the second stage or the booster that we are looking at? I think at that's here? first stage, given I don't see 
um, the engine, but I'm not entirely sure. I also think it might be the booster. We will be able to confirm very soon, because uh, soon the entry burn will begin. They can see it approaching and the timeline here. And with that, I think we have Julia back. Julia, how was that? Well, it was a beautiful sounding launch. Um, remember how I talked about clouds? <laughs> yeah, one snuck in from the north right over my viewing location, but um, that sound did deliver. And I believe we heard Max um, on comms uh, inadvertently saying, oh, wow. So I know he had an excellent view. Yeah, like he was... He was very impressed, apparently. Max was well, Max was happy, um, but it's uh, really uh, like so far a very picture perfect launch. So let's hope that trend continues as we can see the second stage on the right side. Of course, the most important part of this, as the second stage is uh, here to what is that on the left of the? You could you saw that? That was weird. <laughs> That's uh. I have to roll back to that point. On the on the second stage, we there was so like uh, there. What is th is that a lens just, flare? Yeah, it's just lens flare from the sun. I bet. Interesting. I was just sorry. I was just confused there. Um, and of course, on the left side, we see the booster, which is returning and should start its entry burn very very soon. <laughs> yeah, it's not any second UFO. now. And that entry burn will last for approximately 20 seconds, and there's the start of it. So you can see it starts off just with that one single center engine, then boom, there are those three uh, engines. Now they include those two side engines, uh, E1 and E5. Um, and then they'll shut down all three of those uh, before the booster will begin then falling through the atmosphere quicker and quicker before starting to decelerate again from air resistance before doing... Igniting that single center engine for the landing burn, which is scheduled to happen approximately T plus eight minutes. There we go. And I always love this one three one pattern during the entry burn. So uh, yeah, it almost turns like from a from a, a circle shape into this blade kind of shape, where it uh, yeah, it gets crazy. The plume interaction is crazy. I can't wait till we see that with super heavy. <laughs> Absolutely, and there we see the booster uh, re-entering very, very aggressively, which is normal. Um, we'll see. Uh, sometimes they still lose contact. Sometimes they have continuous contact with the booster. Sometimes they just lose it a bit, as it's uh, maybe hard to press signal. There's a big, beautiful uh, shot here of the moon. I believe we will once again, as humanity, land humans on that soon. That's the yeah, booster so again. Pay attention to the bottom left hand of your screen. That is telemetry of the first stage. Um, it looks like it's frozen right now on SpaceX's side. But uh, if we get that back, because any second now landing burn should have started. And um, we'll hopefully see that. So, oh, there we go. It it's is. starting to go down to zero. And then I believe at approximately one kilometer is when that landing burn starts, and you'll see the speed rapidly decrease as they go to the drone ship. Seems like they have some issues today with, with the feed. Yeah, this um, is unusual. Yeah, this is uh, the telemetry, uh, but apparently the landing lights deployed. So, and there we have it. There we go. Wow, that is a gorgeous shot. Holy cow. Yeah, that's not too shabby. <laughs> I like that view. <laughs> yeah, so... F-22. Um, and we, that was SpaceX's 299th landing of a booster and 225th consecutive landing. So it's 225 landings ago that we had a failure. That's crazy. There they both fly into the distance after basically getting the best views. Yeah. Wow. That's like so far. I mean, look at this launch. We got we got F-22s flying over. We got a amazing sound. We got a great view. Uh, Julia, is this is this one of the better Starlings? <laughs> it's definitely been a very entertaining Starlink. And um, I was kind of giggling at Max in the back channel because he said that was just an insane launch experience. And uh, it seems to every launch seems to be a new experience for Max out there, and it was because these F-22s were flying back and forth over Cape all the way up until T-minus zero. So uh, 
here we go again with me in that I am so jealous of their view and being in that sweet ride. So, um, but yeah, I mean, every launch is a good launch, right? I agree. It's uh, if it goes well, it's a good launch. And I also want to point out that uh, nominal orbit has been confirmed by SpaceX. So the uh, the Seeker one is successfully worked. Everything looks good, and uh, the Starlings are on their way to where they should go. So that that's good. There's the 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 view from Doctor uh, Doctor WD forty, uh, which also is not too shabby as a like a view. <laughs> I think they're. Then we can see the cloud that spoiled a bit of the view here for Julian, potentially. Like the cloud layer. Yeah, and I'm not sure uh, if we noted beforehand, but this was already SpaceX's 40th Falcon mission of the year. Uh, 41st mission if you include Starship. So it's just kind of mind-blowing. Um, and currently they're on cadence for, if you just assume that they're on the launch cadence they've had for the first quarter and uh, 18 days of the year uh, goes for the rest of the year. I believe they're at like 138 launches or so. Um, but if you plot out the slightly higher cadence, even that we've just had in the last month or so, SpaceX is honestly like easily reaching that 148 mission goal right now, which is kind of insane to say, given that's a 50% increase in Falcon launches from last year. And that was last year was already insane so i mean this... you know, i could probably contribute a few numbers to you that that <clears throat> put some perspective to this um i had asked the 45th to compile some numbers for me uh which is overall launches from cape per year since i've been here so uh we started with 2016 um because i was trying to quantify my experiences in 2016, there were 18 total launches from Cape Canaveral. 2017, uh -huh. there were 19. 2018, 20. We dipped down um, in 2019 to 17, and then we went back up to 31, 31, and last year we leaped up to 57. So to hear that SpaceX alone has launched 40 Falcons, admittedly not all from here, but a lot of them from here, um, we're going to shatter... I actually don't even have 2023 in there. Uh, spreadsheet, folks, what was that number? But um, 57 in 2022. So, wow, if we're just already in March, middle, almost end of March-ish uh, in 2024, this is going to be a crazy year, y'all. Yeah. It's uh, Not to mention it, Starship. and Yeah. You know. Question, what... What do you think is the most flown rocket after Falcon 9, Trevor, uh, this year? And how many flights does it have? It's kind of crazy. Um, hmm, I mean, family would definitely be Long March. But out of those vehicles, I'm honestly not sure which is launched the most. It's Electron with four. Oh. And that uh, comes into perspective four. the SpaceX team roller. Yes. Yeah, it's like yeah. SpaceX Falcon 9's place one with forty, and place two is Electron with four. Wow, there nobody's even in a double digit behind them. Hm. It's uh, it's honestly, and then there's a lot of long marches which come after that, uh, which uh, is the um, the long march two D is should be the one that is right after that because that is at three flights so far this year, and we'll add a fourth flight very soon. You know, while those numbers sound, when they're an order of magnitude lower than Falcon, sound low, it still is important to highlight that for Rocket Lab, that's a pretty good cadence. They've been wanting to hit that one launch per month target for several years at this point, and it seems like maybe they finally hit that, which is very exciting for them, and, um, you know, they've overcome a lot of issues, so... Huge props to them. Yep, I agree. It's like it's like we are not using this to like dump on any other rocket company. It's just SpaceX is really just so crazy that everything else feels so weirdly small. But still, launching four times in in four months that's still a cadence that not a lot of like that's that's if if you ignore SpaceX, Rocket Lab still is on a basically historic cadence. 
Yeah. Uh, besides, besides SpaceX, so that's that's still impressive on Rocket uh, Rocket Labs. Then. And also out of the Cape soon, which I must say I'm so excited for this launch is Starliner CFT. Uh, you know, three weeks away or so on May sixth, we'll hopefully see um, Starliner and Atlas take off. Um, I believe it's Spacecraft Three. Uh, Starliner will be f- taking those two astronauts to the International Space Station, so that'll be an excite. That'll be a really exciting launch out of the Cape. Um, I mean, uh, you cannot beat crew launches. It's like you can try so hard, but I, I think you cannot beat crew launches. They're they're just a, like the fact that we are able to to get humans into space with rockets. That's just the element of itself is amazing. That's, yeah, I am looking forward to that and. With that, uh, we are apparently into replays f- uh, area here. So, uh, Kevin, roll the replays. Let's let's see what we got. Let's see. Um, is that a Roy new replay on the left? Now I'm curious. I don't see a rocket yet. There oh, there go. it is on the left. There it is. Small Into from the, the clouds. Port. Yep. I think it's maybe passing just in front of the clouds. Yeah, I actually can't tell now. I thought it was going to go into the clouds like 10 seconds ago. <laughs> no, I think it's passing in front of the clouds. There you wow. go. Yeah. Yeah. There it goes. There it flies. Kind of puts in perspective how fast these things go up. And you can also see how it's speeding up, right? Like, at the beginning, it's kind of slow, and then it gets faster and faster and faster. And it's gone. And we have this camera here with the green oxygen wall. There it is in the middle. Look at that. Beautiful conditions. Yeah, I still would love, you know, to bring people from... A hundred years ago or more to the modern day and be like you see that skyscraper over there watch and then it just takes off it's i mean rocketry is just crazy yep absolutely it's uh it's uh, and and watch it take uh like fly once every few days like it's not a it's not like the thing that that humanity focus all efforts on and it's it's just something that has to like everybody has to work together for it to work. It's just this one company that does it right now. And there it flies. Beautiful. There's the there's the close up shot. This is Max's cam, correct? I think so as well. And there's the ignition. And, and pay off. attention to the TE. You can see how far it goes back in this shot. Um, yep. Well past that 45 degree mark. I'm looking at it on the right side right now because this is usually the time where it sometimes even starts to re- like go up again. Yeah, they already start preparing it for the next launch, which I believe the next launch out of this pad is at Starlink 653. Um, which is currently Monday, April 22nd, at uh, actually the exact same launch window. So we'll definitely be live for that one as well. Yep, here we go, rumbles, and we can hear the VAB. And there's Max as well. Yep. That's the VB. Yeah, so Max, Max, oh wow, is reaction to the shock cone. Can we revert to that? I know I'm asking a lot here, Kevin, but can we revert one more time? Because look for that shock, shock cone. It's amazing. Like, I understand why Max reacts to that. I didn't spot it the first time. It's, uh... Look at this front of the rocket. So, look, try to, to keep with the front of the rocket. And at some point, there's like a pop of the shock cone. 
It'll be Which right around max Q. Yep, and it looks amazing. Which a lot of people often wonder, by the way, like, is it a coincidence that Falcon 9 uh, has its max Q or time of maximum aerodynamic pressure right around the time that we see that shot count? And the answer is yes. Uh, Falcon just happens to pass going supersonic and uh, have max Q at about the same time. Um, there it is. Wow, yeah. Yeah. Um, there are... Look at that. It looks beautiful. <laughs> There are plenty of other rockets that have max Q way earlier or get supersonic way uh, earlier. Like, uh, I believe if you look at some of the Minotaur launches, which just leap off the pad with a thrust to weight ratio of my guess is like two or three, um, they will reach uh, supersonic speeds like 10 seconds into flight and max Q a little bit after, like a good amount after that. And in fact, some of those rockets also have to have. Uh, heat shielding on the fairing for ascent because of how quickly it gets off the pad. So, all super interesting things to pay attention to. Yeah, it's a, it's always the problem. Uh, it's almost the I will call it the Falcon Nine problem uh, because you've almost sometimes because we see it so much fall into this problem where you apply Falcon Nine rules to everything else and then you remember wait other rockets are very different to Falcon Nine. It's uh. It's certainly a thing I have to sometimes remind myself of, like, not every rocket is Falcon 9. So, yeah. Absolutely stunning view here. Let's start uh, thanking some people here. Starting with our uh, generous support here we got, uh, starting with uh, Snot Garden with five Red Team memberships. Thank you so, so much for that, and I know I'm late here with thanking people who want to focus on the launch while it's happening. Apocalypse Cow, also very... Uh, common name you hear here uh, with five red team memberships. Thank you so much. Keith Kalavik with a $10 super chat saying, Sorry, Byte Fort, and I can't watch much of the launch, and I can joke with Trevor about 24 FPS. Uh, yeah, Trevor has some opinions about 24 FPS. I know it's that. It's horrible. <laughs> there we go. That's the opinions. Uh, and then we have SpaceX underscore Dragon Doctor with a ten dollar super chat saying a few SpaceX dollars for your support. We love you. I, does this imply what I, I think? It, thank you. I I I don't want to think think too, too deep about this, but uh, thank you so much. Uh, Java with the ten red team memberships gifted. Thank you so so much. And Gus F with the twenty dollar super chat saying I just want to say thank you to you guys. You inspired my interest in aerospace, my freshman year of high school, and now I'm off to study aerospace engineering next year in college. You guys are truly making a difference. That is, I, I mean, I, I hope I hope you're uh, like enjoying it. I, I'm glad we can like contribute and to your excitement. That's just an amazing message, and the fact that you that you're excited about this because we maybe help to excite you. That's 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 amazing. Thank you so much, and good luck with your with your college uh, aerospace engineering. So, absolutely Yo, amazing. I'm not gonna lie, that brought a tear to my eye, and I wish you well in your studies. Yeah, that's like amazing when 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 people tell us like, oh, I got inspired because of you to, to study aerospace engineering. That's how cool is that? And if it's CU's, go Buffs, since CU's a big aero school. And happens to be where I go. <laughs> there we go. Uh, and with that, I want to thank some more people here. Starting with Dr. WD40, who provided a feed for today. Thank you so much for that. That was uh, some amazing views there. And of course, I also want to thank Max and D, who are in the field uh, at the Cape and provided us some of the tracking shots here. So all of these three people provided some shots for today. Thank you all three so, so, so much. And again, I can really say with confidence, this was one of the best views we ever had during a Starlink mission. So uh, really, really amazing work, everybody. Um, we also want to thank uh, Roger here for using one of our bots here for tracking today. Thank you so, so much, Roger, for that. And it's kind of cool that you can just you sit in a PC and then track a rocket launch with one of uh, our bots here. That's that's amazing. And then I want to thank Julia in the field. Julia, thank you so much for being with us today on today's launch. 
It was a pleasure to be here, and I just want to personally thank everyone for joining us. And uh, I want to also thank Trevor here for being very, very amazing today with stats and interesting facts about Falcon 9 and being my co-commentator. Thank you so much, Trevor. Yeah, of course. I hope all my fellow Taylor fans really enjoy the new album tonight in five hours. But thank you, everyone, for joining. And I also want to thank Kevin, Michael, Reed in the background, pushing the buttons, pulling the levers, and uh, yeah, making sure that everything looks as well as it does when it arrives at your screens. Thank you so much, Kevin. And I'm Adrian Bile. I was your host for today. It was a pleasure to watch the launch day with y'all. And I'm looking forward for the next Starlink mission with just a few days from now. See you at that launch as well. And here we go. Nothing to be igniting the flare, correct? Right?